so we're going to move uh, back to Jim, and then we will have, um, I think, Valerie, you wanted to ask some questions. So we'll get you to be ready. But Jim, if you would ask your questions as follow up. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Shane, I'd like to get your perspective on the benefit that has been realized by the restrictions. And I mean, obviously there's more now as of yesterday, but the benefit that has been realized over the last 14 months from the restrictions, as opposed to the damage done to by the restrictions to individuals and businesses. And if it's a, it's been a, a, a balanced sheet or not. Yeah, James, great question. In the context of that, we won't know until this is over. Like, honestly, you, you try to make decisions based on the best data that you have at the time. Um, the, the impacts to small business that we had uh, was not specifically COVID related, which was a bugger too. You know, a lot of folks uh, seem to forget that we were at negative oil prices. So that has an impact and ripple effect. And then you have COVID come along and then you have uh, an oil price war that's taking place and the economy's down. So then we made some, I would uh, uh, propose some uh, decisions we wouldn't make again when it came to which businesses stayed open and which ones didn't, you know, given the facts that you had the rear view mirror now at this point. And again, that was last year. Uh, it's, it's tough, James. Like, I honestly don't know if we made all the right decisions. I can guarantee you we didn't. But to uh, guess of where we're at, we're, we're doing the best we can. We're trying to stay middle of the road. There was that, that balance. And I mean, the catchphrase is lives and livelihoods. We took a different tact and took tons of pressure uh, from other uh, provincial jurisdictions and federally for making those choices. And uh, it's, it's bad. There's a lot of people in a tough spot right now. And again, coming back to that grass fire analogy, that's why we have to get through this last push so we can get things opened up again. And that's, that's literally where we're at. With, uh, with the latest uh, restrictions, it seems that the same businesses are being uh, impeded um, without any proof that they are the cause of the additional spread. So I, I well, guess I don't understand. And, and that's the, the sticking point. It depends whose proof you're talking about. So again, when they have all the contact tracers looking at some of the outbreaks, the, the most <laughs> you want to you wanna try to predict something, try to predict a person. It is the most unpredictable thing on the planet. And I'm not sure how long you've been married. I've been married 20 years and I still can't predict 100% accuracy of what my wife and I are going to fight about on one some day or another. So when you put that in context, you're dealing with 4.5 million people that are potentially moving around. There's no way to predict the unpredictable. So it's a, it's, it's a bit of a bugger. And then the other thing is once you start seeing where we kind of got hit here is these other variants of how quick they transmit. And you can see that in other jurisdictions. We kind of got put behind the eight ball in the vaccinations because that was you know, supposed to catch it. And then you've got all these other moving parts. The thing I think we have at our benefit right now, quite honestly, is the outdoor events. Um, people are able to get outside, get some sunshine, such as Joyce is doing there. And um, you know, Valerie, if you could be outside in the deck, I'm sure you would too. That's the best place, I believe. Because uh, again, anytime you have a a condensed population in confined spaces, that's just, I mean, you're, you're going to get more spread and, and people are going to come in contact. And we've seen that in cold and flu seasons year over year over year. Um, that always happens and it, and it always will. It seems to be the pattern of Mother Nature. Shane, if, if, is there any way we could get access to actual data from AHS to justify the latest business closures? Yeah, so you can look in. at uh, anything on AHS that, that has the information there, and then everything is FOIPable, so the freedom of information. You can literally write in and, and access anything that you want that, that, that can be accessed. Okay, as our representative, I'm asking you for that information. Oh, I don't have it. Well, so and they wouldn't, I, would, I would have to write up my own FOIP report specifically, James. And, and honestly, it's better if, if you do it. I can put you to the right directions. But again, it, it's uh, there. you're asking for something that I, I can't get you. It, you would probably be in the best position to ask for yourself. I can help you through the process, but I wouldn't feel comfortable trying to get specific information under FOIP that, that you would want. Okay, I will follow up with you on that. Okay, and we can but help last, you out with that. Whatever the specifics are, we'll try to navigate. And that's, that's where I said it's kind of like the juggler going around trying to navigate through the system sometimes too. The last part of my question, sorry, I don't want to take up too much more time, but uh, what does your government plan to accomplish with this latest round of restrictions as of yesterday? And where is the yeah, proof? Yeah, so the, oh, sorry. And where is the proof that these measures work? Well, as they say, the proof is in the pudding. And you guys have been holding me to account, rightly so, for decisions and actions that the government has taken. Not as me as the elected representative has that. I only get a chance to try to voice like you are to me tonight. Um, what we're trying to do is to slow how many people 
potentially get infected all at the same time based on all the data and the information that we have with people's behaviors and with all that contact tracing that's been done to date with, from my understanding, consultation with other jurisdictions to see what works and what doesn't. And then we've chosen our own path. So again, this James, really it's, if, if the trajectory stays at the same time and, and a lot of people will not believe me and it doesn't matter because take your own version of it, that it really comes down to the ICU capacity of what is really there for the intensive care units. And if anybody's ever seen what one of those looks like, you'll understand that those people uh, put in tremendous hours, effort, et cetera. And it takes two years to train up somebody new. So we can't just spool up a new nurse who can work in the ICU, that's the issue. So you only have a limited number of people who've been working with this and only a limited number of beds. And what we're really hoping uh, to do is to try to literally um, stop the spread so we don't crash the system all at once. And if that takes a bit of a, a pause here, most people get that. Again, the end date is to, to make sure we get through this thing and wrap it up, put the genie back in the bottle and get back to normal. So just to um, move on, thank you, uh, Jim. That was excellent. And thanks for the answer, Shane. Uh, just to let you know that all through the pandemic, if you will, there were videos being taken of hospitals and- And it's um, not hospitals, Carla, and that's where it gets misconstrued. So I've seen TikTok videos of people jumping around that are nursing staff. So I'm talking specifically ICUs. So if you wanna talk apples to apples, then you have to go to the ICU. It's not about the hospital capacity. Well, we, we managed again, to get the hospital capacity taken care of based on the information we had. And there necessary. could be as much video or information as you want yes, at a given snap point in time. And what all the concerns are, I always come back to the same thing, ICUs. which is the ICU units which and is the IC units and the people there that can operate them. So again, you can show me as many pictures as you want on social media, TikTok or otherwise. I think we've yeah. all seen them. Okay, well, um, you know, I think that the constituents feel like they're being lied to. And that's well, I what think I the constituents and, and this dialogue back and forth should show that there's a different opinion than what you might possess. So again, if, if individuals want to look at an ICU, you have to look at that because again, like when we ask these instance, same, when we ask these same questions, we, we bring those forward as MLAs and going, look, look at the Marathorpe Hospital as an example, look at Westlock, what do we have there for capacity? What we looked at doing was trying to push out some of those ancillary services that were taking place in the big centers out to those areas. Westlock was an example of that, of looking at hospital capacity where you could take people that weren't going to be in that ICU stream and push them outwards. That's what has been taking place, and no one is recognizing that. Again, it's ICUs, not hospitals. Which I have already established, the people that I associate with are in ICUs. So have your so, ICU people that want to tell me they're yeah. not busy, make sure they line up, get on camera, and write that down, because I would love to take that back to the medical association. You get the Absolutely. ICU guys that say they're not stressed, they're not tired, no. and they're not doing much. I would love to hear that. All right, well, um, can we have a guarantee that they won't be attacked? Oh, I will guarantee first. we'll get them on video. You can stand there with me and we can get them telling us and against all their colleagues and everything else they're telling us that they so have they a, abundant bullied. capacity in the ICUs and they're just hanging around. I would love to hear that, Carla. Please, I, I would be the first to sign we, up for that. We, we know that tactic, okay.